this is a good day. If I could sum up what I am sensing in my spirit right now, it would be just simply this. Jesus loves me. This I know. There is such an awesome sense of the presence of Jesus. I want you to take a journey with me today back to the book of Genesis. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, I want to read some scripture to you that will be up on the screen as well as in your own Bible. Perhaps your translation will be just a little different than this. But in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, the Scripture says the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. That's where He put the man whom He had formed. The Lord God made all the trees grow out of the ground. These trees were nice to look at because God always makes things beautiful. He can take the ugliest stuff and make it incredibly beautiful. The most broken stuff and make it beautiful. And their fruit was good to eat. Because when you feast on what God has made and created, it's going to do you good. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil grew in the middle of the garden. The middle of the garden for Adam and Eve was the very center of their life. Then there is a scripture that you must not miss that follows in Genesis chapter 3. And it is verse number 1. The serpent was clever. Do not ever underestimate the serpent. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. And he spoke to the woman. Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden. In the very beginning, God, who had his own house, created a backyard. Creation is God's backyard. And when he created it, like perhaps maybe your backyard, it had critters in it. And he needed something, someone, to take authority and dominion in his backyard. And so the highest of his creation, man and woman, were given the privilege to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, and to have dominion over everything in God's backyard. Now, I can't prove this, but it would appear that possibly when God created Adam and Eve, He intended for them to live in His back garden for a thousand years. And then they would just simply move into the house. Because remember, between God's house and God's backyard, there was a seamless transition. There was no death, no veil, no wall, no separation. In fact, God moved seamlessly between His habitation and His creation. We read that in Genesis 3 because the Bible says, And God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, if He did that after Adam and Eve had sinned, how much more before and so here is God moving back and forth between His habitation and His creation. And here is Adam and Eve who possibly were given a thousand years. And then they would just move in the house with Dad. And in that time, they were given the rulership and authority and the opportunity to consider this to touch 25 generations of family. 
Consider this. Noah, by the time we meet him, he's 500 years old. Noah has spent about, if in a pre-fall condition, about half of his life. So if you went to Noah's birthday celebration, what you would discover is this. That Noah would have 12 generations at his birthday party that had come from him. And he would have 12 generations that would have come before him. So he would have had parents and grandparents and great-grandparents all the way back 12 generations. And then he would have had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren all the way down for 12 generations. One of the things that our world so desperately needs and is missing today is generational transference. We have lost generational transference. In other words, the values and the God that was so much a part of our nation and our fabric of our very life is no longer being transferred generationally. God intended for it to all be transferred generationally. And so that after a thousand years, perhaps, you say, Pastor Buddy, why do you say a thousand years? Well, one of the reasons why is because when Jesus returns and he reigns on the earth, he will reign for a thousand years. And it just seems like that he is occupying the place that the first Adam did not occupy and refused. And besides, Adam lived 930 years. Uh, even in a sinful condition, he lived 930. He could have easily lived a thousand and then just moved right into dad's house. Now, when God created them, he put in every man a witness of eternity. Ecclesiastes tells us that. In the heart of every person, there is the witness of eternity. In other words, there is something inside every person that witnesses that there is more than just what we see. I believe one of the reasons why that people today are so angry. People are very angry today. I believe the main reason why people in general are angry, it's not because we eat too much sugar. I don't even think it's the government's fault. I believe the reason that people are angry is subconsciously people are fighting a battle within themselves of the witness of eternity. Most atheists that I have ever been in contact with are angry people. Because they are subconsciously continuing to battle the witness that is inside of them about eternity. Now, Adam had more than the witness. He had an awareness of eternity. He was a God thinker. In other words, Adam thought about God. He considered God. He considered the habitation of God. He thought God thoughts. He considered heaven. He considered hell. He understood all of that. He had that in his consciousness. Today, people don't think about God as a rule. It's not in their thoughts. In fact, the Bible says one of the ways of the marks of the wicked is God is not in any of their thoughts. So people do not consider eternity. They don't consider Jesus. They don't consider God. In fact, if you just mention him, it's like something so totally off the wall that is so out of reality, that it is not even worth considering. And so here is Adam with this God consciousness who is in this garden. And along comes a critter. Because Adam and Eve are walking in the knowledge of God. All they know is what God knows. And in the center of the garden, they have a choice. Every time they come to the center of garden, they have a choice. There are two trees in the middle of the garden. One is the tree of life or the tree of knowing God or knowing relationally God himself. Then there is another tree of knowing everything else, knowing what is outside of God. May I just say to you, that all you ever need to know is what Jesus knows. If Jesus doesn't know it, you don't need to know it either. You say, Pastor Buddy, Jesus knows everything. 
Well, Jesus chooses not to know a lot of things. He chooses today not to know about what I was. No more. And Adam was choosing to know God relationally, intimately by the tree of life. Along comes the critter who decides that he is going to attack everything that is associated with God because he hates God. And he hates everything that is created in the image of God. And so he goes to the top of the food chain. He goes directly to the man and to the woman. Because he is out to destroy the man and the woman. Because there is a contest going on. There is a contest between light and darkness. Between the lover and the hater. And between the giver and the destroyer. And that contest is still going on today. And you and I have the same choice that Adam had. We get to choose what we're going to know. We're either going to eat from that tree and we're going to know God relationally or we're going to know things outside of God that are going to keep us from knowing God and encountering Him. Let me show you what I mean. When Adam sinned, he became a man who knew too much. Ah, how do you know that, Pastor Buddy? Because God says to him, how do you know you are naked? Where did you get that knowledge? I never told you that. Adam moved into a contrary, contesting knowledge that literally drove him away from his father. Because you cannot eat from both trees. You are either going to know what God knows, or you are going to know something other than what God knows, which will keep you from knowing Him and experiencing Him. So what does Adam do? Now that he knows God, oh, he knows God now, he runs. He hides. Because what he knows is contrary to what he has known in God. And because it is contrary to what he's known in God, he now chooses that knowledge rather than knowing God. And he runs and he hides from God. He knows too much. There was a man in a parable in Matthew 25 who was a servant. And he was disobedient to his master and he buried his gift, his talent, whatever you want to call it, in the soil. His master comes to him and says, why did you do that? And what does the servant say to his master? Because I knew you to be a man who is hard and you reap where you do not sow. And so the master immediately recognizes that what this servant now knows is keeping him from knowing his master. Do you know it is possible for you to know something today that is literally keeping you from encountering God? I love this. My wife sent a message to someone on Facebook. Facebook is great for sending messages. <laughs> now let me just say that some people put things on Facebook that nobody needs to know. Way too much information. This was a man that we both knew from our college days who was a pastor. And he was bemoaning on Facebook that he didn't have a pulpit. He didn't have a church. He didn't have anybody to listen to him preach. I thought, I will gladly send you this pulpit. If you want a pulpit, have this one. 
Shouldn't we aim a little higher? Don't we want the presence of God more? Don't we want to see people's lives transformed more than we want a pulpit? So my wife, in her meekness and mercy, (laughs) just simply passed a beautiful little verse of Scripture to him as a way of encouragement. Guess what he did? He sent a response that said this. Thanks for the verse. I already know that. Now watch. Don't miss this. This is a key to life right here. What he thought he was telling her was, I'm familiar with that scripture. What he is really telling her is this. I know that, but I also know a bunch of other stuff over here that is working against what you're telling me, and I am choosing to camp out in what I know apart from God rather than what I know in God. That's the only way you can stay bemoaning your condition. He chooses to know that more than what he knows in God. And it is keeping him from encountering God. See, this is the way Jesus lived his life. He only knew what God knew. Let me show you what I mean. John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, Jesus answered them, I tell you the solemn truth, the Son can do nothing on his own initiative. He can't even think without the Father. He can't work without the Father. He can't speak without the Father. But only what he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Wow. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he does. Now watch the last verse in verse 30. I can do nothing on my own initiative just as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is always just. In other words, what I think Jesus said, what I know Jesus said, I know because of my Father and not from anything else that is surrounding me. I only know what God knows. There was a man that came to Jesus, desperate, because his daughter was very sick. By the time that Jesus got headed in the right direction to get to his house, his friends come and tell him, tell Jesus, don't even bother coming because she's already died. How heartbreaking. How heartbreaking. Do you know what Jesus told the man? He said, I'm coming anyway. Don't you be afraid. Just believe. Right? So Jesus comes up to this house, and before he even gets inside, he can hear this weeping and wailing and moaning going on as only Middle Easterners can mourn. Come on, they have a special way that they mourn. And the people that had filled that house were professional mourners. These people, all they did was mourn death. They were paid to do it. And those people in that house knew death. They understood it. They recognized it. You didn't need to tell them about death. They were experts on death. So Jesus walks into this house with all this clamoring going on. He makes his way over to where the girl is already being uh, uh, memorialized and, and whatever else they're doing to her. And he waves his hands and he says, stop weeping. She is not dead. She's asleep. Really? Everyone, Luke 8, was crying and mourning for her, but he said, stop crying, for she is not dead but asleep. And they started laughing at him. Because why? They, what? Knew she was dead. They knew something that Jesus didn't know. Because when he walked in that house, his father said, she's not dead, she's asleep, and I'm going to raise her. 
what are you mourning over today that Jesus has never declared is dead? Woo. Mm. Wow. So what happened to those people? They got sent out of the room. They missed the kingdom. The kingdom came and they missed it. Why? Because they knew more than Jesus. They just knew too much. In the book of Mark, there is an encounter that Jesus has very similar to this. He comes down off the mountain. A father again comes to him in desperation. My son is demon-possessed. That's back when people used to actually believe in demons. My son is under demonic influence. He is destroying him. Jesus comes over, sees this convulsing son on the ground. Let me give you the scripture for it. Mark 9, 26. Jesus rebukes the spirit and the evil spirit screamed and caused the boy to fall on the ground again. Then the spirit came out because that's what spirits do in the face of the name of Jesus. The boy looked as if he were dead. And many people standing around that just witnessed this, they're saying, he's dead. He killed him. Everybody in the circle is saying the boy is dead. What are you going to say? They have written this kid off. He is done, finished, over, dead, and buried. Have you written something off that God hasn't? <laughs> if Jesus had been taking his knowledge from those that were around him, he would have walked away and said, well, we'll do better next time. The consensus is, it's dead. Amazingly, Jesus doesn't take his knowledge from those that are around him. He listens to his Father. Remember, everything that Jesus needed to know was in his Father. Yeah. So what happened? Look at it in the Amplified. The boy lay pale and motionless like a corpse so that many of them said, He is dead. But because you can never have an encounter with Jesus and be worse off than you were before, Jesus is not walking away from this. And so what does Jesus do? But Jesus, but, contrary to all of this stuff going on, Jesus, Jesus took a strong grip of his hand and look began lifting him up, pulling on dead weight, all the while knowing this kid's going to live. It can't be any other because this is what my father has said. Wow. Pharisees had a tough time receiving Jesus, most of them anyway. Because they just knew too much. In John chapter 9, there was a, a man that was born blind, and disciples walked by and said to Jesus, uh, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? Now, where'd they get that from? That's knowledge outside of God. That was knowledge they were taught. Because they were taught that if you are infirmed and poor, God's against you. And if you're healthy and wealthy, God's for you. That was the standard teaching of the day. So Jesus has to first correct that because their knowledge is outside the knowledge of God. By the way, Paul did tell the Corinthian church, be careful because there are a lot of things that try to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So Jesus says to them, neither one. He says, this whole thing is just so God can get glory. 
and you're getting ready to see it. And so Jesus puts some stuff and rubs it on the guy's eye, and he says to the guy who's been born blind, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. Now, any right-thinking person would know there is absolutely no healing power in that pool. Why would I need to do that? There's no healing power there. There is no record of anybody ever being healed at the pool of Siloam all the way back to the days of Nehemiah where the pool is first mentioned. Why in the world would I do that? I know better than that. But the man, instead of, bless you, instead of knowing what he thought he knew, just decided to know what Jesus knew. That simple. I'm just going to know what Jesus knows. And he went and washed, and he was healed. Now, the Pharisees see this, and they don't like it. How did this guy, who's a sinner, how did he get healed? And at the end of this encounter, there is this scripture that you must see. In John chapter 9, some Pharisees overheard him, that's Jesus, and says, does that mean you're calling us blind? Now, the reason why they said that is because they knew they weren't. Right? Yes, oh no, we're not blind. Jesus said, if you were really blind, you would be blameless because you would then have released it to the knowledge of God. But since you claim to see everything so well, you've got all this stuff figured out. You know more than God. You're accountable for every fault and failure. Now, let me give you the simplified Tower City Church version of that last bit. Can I? This is John 9, 4, 1, simplified. Jesus said, what you already know will not allow you to receive what you really need. Wow. The town of Nazareth had a hard time with Jesus. That was his hometown. They had a really difficult time with him. Let me show you why. Mark 6, 3, he's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've what? We've known him since he was a kid. We what? We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling, and they never got any further. They could not receive what they were promised and given because they knew too much. Let me give you one other great example in the Scripture of people who actually do receive from Jesus. There were plenty of people who did receive. Do you know what the one characteristic of all those people was? They just simply knew that Jesus was their answer. That's it. He's my remedy. He's my solution. He's my help. He's everything I need. Now let me show you how powerful this is. There was a lady who had a disease for 12 years. That's tough. And on top of that, she wasn't getting any better. She was getting worse. And on top of that, she had spent all of her money trying to get better. Everything she had. And on top of that, every doctor that she visited could not help her get better. Bless them, they can't do everything. This is not an indictment on doctors. They just couldn't help her. And then she finds herself in a crowd... And Jesus is way off in the distance. And yet, with all of that knowledge, with perhaps a little thrown in of maybe 
I'm just meant to be this way anyway. This is what the scripture says she did. For she thought to herself. You know what that is? That's knowledge. If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. She is not thinking about, man, I've had this for 12 years. I'm getting worse every day. The doctors can't help me. I've spent all my money. The crowd is too big. I can't get to him. Maybe I don't even merit any of this anyway. None of that was in her mind. Why? Because if it had been, she would have missed Jesus. Because what you know outside of what Jesus knows will keep you from Jesus. What do we know? Can I tell you very quickly the one thing? In fact, it wouldn't take us long to just delineate everything that we need to know. Now, we're not talking about information here. We're talking about revelation. The one thing that you need to know more than anything else is you need to know your Father. Listen. Jesus came to connect me to my Father. Jesus said, no man can come to the Father except by me. Jesus is the beginning, the end, and everything in between. He is the beginning of life. He is the end of days. And He is the power of for living. Now listen. Suppose someone says, but I'm a nice person. I don't need that. I'm doing okay. I'm sort of living life. Do you know what God would call them? He would say of them, you are a man who knows too much. There are people who have actually said this to me. I prayed and God did not answer my prayer. So I now know about God. And do you know what's happening? Because they choose to know that, they cannot know Him. If you know your father, you cannot be angry with him. Yes. You cannot be bitter. Because what you know about your father, when you know your father, is this. That he is incredibly good. Do you know what God told his people? He told Jeremiah, he said, I want you to go tell my people... I have plans to do you good and not evil. I have plans to give you a hope and a future. When you know your father, you know he's great. You know that he can take the most tragic, destructive, broken, impossible situation and redeem it for good. With everything that happened to Job, do you know what the Bible says? At no time did he ever blame God for anything. Why? Because he knew his father. The serpent spends 24 hours a day accusing your father to you. What you may know today 
can keep you from encountering your father right now. There are people who are Christians who have problems encountering their father because of something they know that God never told them. Something about yourself, something about your situation, your family, your future, whatever it is, that you know. There are people who have written off things and given up. Do you know why people commit suicide? Because they know stuff that God doesn't know. You know what they know? I'm in a hopeless situation. There is no answer. There is no out. There is no remedy. I am worthless. And there is no reason for me to live anymore. Every bit of that is a lie. And it comes right out of the pit. But it is knowledge that competes with the knowledge of God. The Holy Spirit shows us when there are things that we know that God doesn't know. I would say to you today, you may be here and you need to get to know your Father. You've never come to Jesus. Jesus is the only way to know the Father. In fact, Jesus said, if you've known me and you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It is possible today, now think about this, it is possible today for a person to walk into this room not having a relationship with their Father and to walk out with an intimate relationship with the God of creation. Only God can do that. Or you may, you just may assume something today that God has never said to you about your situation. And it's time. It's time to let it go. So that you can encounter what Jesus has for you even this day. We're not going to eat from both of those trees, one or the other. The Bible says, choose life. That's how good He is. He doesn't want one thing to keep you from experiencing all that He is. That's how good he is.